My name is Jessica. I am a 22-year-old mental health advocate living in St. Catharines. I hope you don't mind me sharing a bit of my story. I've been fighting since I was a baby. When I was two years old, I got cancer. I had little chance of surviving. A few months after I came home from the hospital, my parents noticed that I was starting to walk unsteady and was just very weak. They took me to the hospital where I stayed for weeks, getting weaker and weaker, to the point where I couldn't even smile. After running a bunch of tests, they diagnosed me with viral encephalitis, which affected the part of my brain that affects my motor skills. When I finally got to go home, my brother who was nine months old at the time, could do more than me. The doctors told my parents they had no idea how much better I would get. They told them that whatever gains I made at six months after discharge would probably be all that I would ever be able to do. At six months, I couldn't even talk and was tube fed. So boy did I prove them wrong. I just graduated college, with honors in journalism. I went to college by myself every day, with no support workers, just like anyone else. High school wasn't easy. I got misunderstood a lot by teachers, educational assistants, peers, and crushes. I had a crush on one of the more popular boys. He and his friends treated me terribly online. I was cyberbullied. He told me things I wanted to hear, which made his behavior okay in my mind. So I kept talking to him and talking to him. When I was in grade 10, I started experiencing symptoms of anxiety. I had no idea what that was at the time. I started acting up. I started throwing small fits in the middle of class. I started running off and hiding in the corner of the school. I refused to do any of my work. There was so much noise and voices in my head and I just wanted to tell it to shut up. I was misunderstood by the teachers and educational assistants. They always thought it was a behavior or disability issue and that I was acting this way just because I wanted to. I couldn't control any of it. But I didn't exactly know what was wrong with me either. I was always being watched. I had an educational assistant watching me almost all the time. I found it hard to do work with someone watching over my shoulders. It was an anxiety thing, even though I didn't know it at the time, but everyone saw it as me refusing to do work. During lunch or my break, if someone saw me out of my wheelchair, they would freak and say I could fall and die. I've fallen lots of times but I usually just get a headache. At the beginning of grade 11, I started showing signs of depression. Same thing happened. I had never heard of it. I thought it was just another word for sad. One of my educational assistants, Angel, who came here with me today, was the only one who listened to me and saw that I had potential. The only one who saw beyond the way I was acting. The only one who gave me space and breaks when I needed it. One day, she brought me to a room. She told me she noticed I was showing signs that something might be wrong asked me if I was okay. I didn't really know. She told me she was concerned and that maybe I should talk to someone. It was around the time that Demi Lovato, my favorite singer, was admitted to a treatment center for mental health and substance abuse issues. It was the first time I heard about mental illness. Everything slowly started to make sense. I saw the school counselor who eventually recommended that I see my doctor. She diagnosed me with anxiety and mild depression. I remember the lack of support from my best friend at the time. I remember her being like, you're not depressed. At a later date, I remember showing her scratches on my wrist, from the first time I self-harmed. She got mad at me because others had it worse and called an attention seeker. I self-harmed, but lightly, about half a dozen times in high school and a bit during my first year of college but I was lucky it never became a huge issue for me. I went to high school for five years. My last two years were better. I actually knew what was wrong with me. I could use it to defend myself. I got more independence on my lunch and breaks. I was 18. There was nothing anyone could really do if I wanted to get out of my wheelchair or go out for lunch. My school counselor normally did hall duty. She watched me but she had that, 
if she falls and hurts herself, it's her fault attitude, which I loved, because that's exactly what I thought. I have had a conflicting relationship with both of my parents. My dad left when I was 12. I was blindsided. I came home from school one day, he sat me down and told me he was leaving. When I got older, I learned more about why he left and things about his girlfriend at the time. The more I found out, from other people, the angrier I got. Partially because I didn't want to find out from other people. We got into a lot of fights. We said harsh things to each other. Our relationship still isn't that great but it's gotten better over the years. I live with my mom and younger brother. There used to be a lot of yelling in the house. My mom took a lot of her frustrations and anxiety out on my brother and I. Whether she was yelling to me or near me, it still affected me. Every little thing got to me. I was scared. The yelling has calmed down over the past year or so, because my mom started to realize how much it affected me. But any drama or life stressors on top on any mental illness, just makes everything worse. I eventually started to get scared of myself. I loved college. Mostly because of the independence and the fact that I could live my own life. I had no one telling me what to do. I made mistakes, having no one watching me, but I learned from them. I was more successful in college than I ever was in high school. And I graduated with honors. I was grateful that, on the first day of college, I met my best friend, Carly who has been amazing to me ever since. I mean, we have fights but they are lessons learned and only makes us stronger. Being a couple years older than me, she teaches me a lot. I love her, like a sister. September 2014, I got drunk at a party at the pub in my college. I had been dealing with some issues that, I guess, escalated when I was drunk. I had a psychotic breakdown, where I ended up in the hospital. Carly came with me. My family didn't know I was there until months after. I didn't tell them because I didn't know how they would react. I struggled afterwards. Mostly because I lived day by day, pretending it never happened. I went to school the day after, finding excuses to stay late or go out after, just to stay out of the house for a little longer. The only person I trusted at the time was Carly. I became dependent on her. At the end of October 2014, I decided to try sobriety, which wasn't easy being a 20-year-old college student where drinking was the normal thing to do. I was never addicted, but I realized that whenever I drank, I'd overdo it. One drink never meant one. Alcohol would also trigger all my negative emotions and most of the time, I would end up having a breakdown. About a couple months later, I had a couple drinks. But then after that, I stayed sober for approximately seven months. Relapsing and the reasoning as to why I relapsed, was the worst mistake I ever made. I got drunk, to the point where I threw up because I got jealous. To make things worse, Carly and I got into a huge fight. My dependency on her got to a point where it just wasn't healthy, for either of us. I was losing my independence and she was losing her freedom. We exchanged some harsh words and ended up splitting for almost two months. Losing her, for what I thought was forever, was probably the hardest thing I've ever experienced. I hated myself for getting drunk that night. I still do sometimes. But I remember, it was a mistake and that I am not the person I was that night. I also learned a lot from it and in fact, I think it made Carly and I stronger. A couple weeks before my relapse, I went to the hospital for having suicidal thoughts. Now, I have been to the hospital three times in the past two years, I won't tell you all of the stories but I do want to talk about this one. Carly took me to the hospital, and we actually got sent to the mental health unit straight away. We got locked in a tiny, cold room with white padded walls, and only a mattress and very thin blanket. We waited and waited. She held me, talked to me, stroked my hair, almost the whole eight hours she waited with me. After she left, someone came and talked to me. They told me there was a good chance I was staying for a 72-hour observation. 
I begged for them to let me go. The thought of staying scared me. That room scared me. I knew deep down I didn't belong there. I just couldn't stay there. They called Carly and asked if I could go to her house, because I felt safer there than the two places I should feel safe, home and the hospital. But honestly the whole eight hours of her talking and holding me, was kind of life-changing and it made me think. I didn't want to end my life because that would mean leaving her. The thought of never being able to touch or talk to her, or anyone, again hurt me way too much. It would also mean leaving everything else I loved about life. And because of that, suicide is no longer an option for me. It hasn't even been something that passes my mind. I fight for myself. And when that's not enough, I fight for the people I love. Today, I'm alive and healthy. I am dealing with my depression and anxiety through self-care and doing the things I love most, which includes spending time with Carly, advocating, and helping people. I have a mental health-based blog, where I share stories and knowledge through writing. I do it for free and wanting nothing out of it, but to help others. Demi Lovato inspired my blog. I didn't realize how much words can help someone until Demi started speaking about these topics and helping her fans. She inspires me all the time. I've had the pleasure of meeting her twice, giving her a hug, telling her I'm proud of her, and thanking her for everything she does. A few weeks ago, someone came to me asking for help. Their friend was unemployed and in a bad position. I helped them find a job. It felt really good to be able to help someone like that. And I am here, sharing my story with you guys. Not only does what I do help others but it helps me. Whenever I help someone, it motivates me. It makes me feel good. When I'm depressed, it gives me purpose and makes me feel like there's a reason why I'm here. I share my story to help others, to let them know they're not alone, to let them know they're not crazy, to show them there is hope. There is a reason why they're alive. In Canada, one out of five people struggle with a mental illness. Many don't get the help that they need and deserve. Don't be afraid to speak up and ask for help. Self-care isn't selfish. We have to do what we have to do to get better. Figure out what you need and just ask for it. Go see your doctor and get your mental health checked up. Physical health is just as important as mental health. If not, more. Your doctor will be able to help determine what would be best for you. Even if they just throw pills at you, which unfortunately happens a lot, it could potentially save your life. I know what it's like to be in a dark place where you feel like giving up and that there's no hope, and it pains me to know that there are millions of people feeling like that every day. There is hope, even when it feels like there's none. Please hang in there. I know it's hard. It takes time and effort but it's so worth it. There's people out there rooting for you. One of those people is me. I will always be there for those who feel like they have no one. Recovery is possible. Happiness is possible. It can get better. Thank you for those who have helped me get to where I am today. Thank you to Shelly for all that you do. Thank you for listening to my story. Stay strong. It does get better. I believe in you.